we're already getting our questions coming in. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, yes, today we were talking just about pests. Of course, I will be doing the intro. Here is, with me is Suzanne, and I am Charlotte. We are IPM advocates with Our Water, Our World. Um, let's look at our agenda today. So we, I see everyone, lots of people already asking about pests and that's fine. Feel free to keep um, adding pests to the list. What today we're gonna talk, of course, we're gonna talk about the Our Water, Our World program. I will talk about IPM as I, we always do. Um, and then we are gonna cover this list of pests, snails and slugs, earwigs and pill bugs, or also called sow bugs, citrus and veggie leaf miner, flea beetles, cabbage looper, beetles and weevils, fungal diseases, mosquitoes, rats and gophers and other urban critters. We're also gonna squeeze in ants and aphids. And if we have time at the end, we will answer those other additional questions that are coming in. And of course, we always will supply you with resources to um, find out some more information for yourself if we don't answer your question. And of course, you can always email us with further questions. And we are brought to you today by the Alameda Countywide Clean Water Program uh, that works to protect the Alameda County Creeks, wetlands, and the bay from runoff that may carry pollutants into waterways. So we are focused today on mostly gardening and avoiding the chemicals that we use, that sometimes people use in gardens that can be washed off into the storm drains by irrigation and rain. And today we're just talking about pests, like individual pests, but we have covered lots of information in the past. So if you want more information on uh, the good bugs, water-wise gardening, soil health, weed management, uh, veggie gardening, and lots of more, we have all of our past programs on the Clean Water Program YouTube channel. And you can access that if you go to the Clean Water Program uh, website, they have a link directly to their YouTube channel. And you can also sign up to get their newsletter um, on the right side of the cleanwaterprogram.org website. Uh, if you add your email there, you will be able to receive newsletters about upcoming events, including webinars like these. And for those of you who are new and have not heard of the Our Water Our World program, we are going to tell you about it. Um, it is a award-winning program in about 23 or so counties and growing in the Bay Area, Greater Bay Area, and you know um, across California. And we're expanding. Uh, what we do is we partner partner with retailers like. Ace Hardware's, Home Depot's, Garden Centers, and Independents to provide pest problem solving education to the consumer. In the many stores, we um, have this rack that you can see on the photo on the left that has information sheets um, about lots of common pests, some of what we're going to cover today and some of what we're not going to cover. You can also see all of those fact sheets on our website at ourwaterourworld.org. Also in some stores, we also have posters with QR codes. So you can just scan that code and pull that fact sheet right up on your phone. And then also many stores have these blue tags like the top uh, right um, and the, the bottom right, you can see they highlight the eco-friendly products on the shelf. So making, so if you are choosing to buy a pesticide, you can find the most eco-friendly product on the shelf. There is also information about eco-friendly products and um, water quality at ourwaterourworld.org. So what we talk about a lot at Our Water World is we really want to draw the connection between what we're doing out in the world and our waterways. And there is actually a direct line. Everything we're doing out in our yards, in our driveway, on the street, walking our dog, washing our car, gardening, um, any kind of debris, litter, pet waste, soaps, chemicals, et cetera, fertilizers, they, with rain, irrigation, and any kind of urban runoff, they find their way into the storm drains at the street level, and they then go directly to the nearest creek, river, 
and bay or ocean. Um, so what we want to do is really be aware of all of the things that we're doing out in the world and keep that in mind. And so if we can limit the amount of things that we can that will get into the waterway, um, the healthy our healthier our waterways will be. And one way we can keep our waterways healthy is by practicing integrated pest management. So all the pests today, we're gonna to approach with an IPM perspective. So I'm gonna give you a big, big picture view of what integrated pest management is. Um, it's a, basically it's a decision-making process and it uses science-based strategies. Um, and it's really, it's a holistic view of the garden um, or the home. And it really takes into consideration all the factors. So it's not just um, you know, focusing on the pest, it's taking a step back, looking at the big picture. And a lot of times we, we ask a lot of questions. We want to know what is the problem at hand. A lot of times we'll see a symptom of a bigger problem. And in treat, instead of treating the symptom, we want to find what the problem really is. And then we can treat that. And then also understand our thresholds. Can we live with it? Um, our, you know, our, is the pest causing a lot of damage or is it really just a nuisance? So the steps to integrated pest management, um, we always wanna focus on identification. Uh, is it a pest or is it some other kind of issue, fertilizing, watering, et cetera? And if it is a pest, we of course wanna know what exactly we're looking at, what kind of bug is it, what kind of rodent is it, what kind of weed is it? All that is going to be important to be able to um, effectively and safely uh, treat that problem. And then prevention is really big in integrated pest management. There are a lot of things we can do in the garden and the home before pests even show up to prevent them from coming in. And that can be just focusing on the health of our plants or you know, adding screens on our windows. It looks like a lot of different things. Then when we want to take action steps, we have a pest, we've identified it, we want to take some steps to get rid of it. Uh, the, in integrated pest management, there are four kinds of action steps or controls. There's cultural controls, which is really focusing on the health of the garden. The, healthy, the healthier the garden is, the uh, less pests you'll have and the easier the plants will bounce back from any pest infestations. So if we focus on the health of the garden with many things we've talked about in previous webinars, proper fertilizing, watering, soil health, proper plant care, putting the right plant in the right place, all those will lead to a healthier uh, garden with less pests. Then there are mechanical controls. Those are traps, barriers, tools, physical things that we can use to keep uh, pests away from our plants and our homes. Then there's biological controls, which is really understanding and supporting the ecosystem um, around our garden because there are beneficial insects that can keep pests in balance. There are other things birds, uh, reptiles, snakes, lizards, and other mammals that can also keep balance in the garden. And then always as a last resort, we have our chemical controls, which are pesticides. Some people choose not to go this far and they, if you know, sometimes if the plant is just not happy and you've tried focusing on the health and all of these other tactics, it might be best to just um, remove the plants altogether because a pesticide is unlikely to help it at that point. So again, pesticides are our last resort. We go, we're going to use the least toxic possible um, and we're going to spray very carefully and we'll talk about chemical controls at the end. So I just wanted to share that's the overview of IPM. Each one of our approaches to these individual pests will have different types of controls that we will take for each pest. Okay, so um, I just like to ask, what is the very first step with the pest management? So we see a pest in the garden. What's the first thing we want to do? We want to identify. Identification is key. As Charlotte mentioned, if we can't identify the pest, it's going to be really challenging to solve that problem. Uh, this is a picture of a soldier beetle, and unfortunately, um, this good bug gets uh, blamed for a lot of damage in the garden. And uh, I can't tell you how often I hear folks say, oh, I just killed a bunch of them. 
So it's really important to properly identify uh, what's going on and to look a little closer because oftentimes there are some beneficial insects or garden allies are out there already, you know, working on the problem for us. So, uh, but here's the thing, you know, um, this picture of a rosebud is just covered with aphids. This is pretty uh, significant. Okay, hopefully no one has aphids this bad. There's a few of you that asked us to talk about aphids. I'm sorry, we didn't prepare that exact slide, but uh, I have it here, so I'm going to talk about it. Uh, when we have um, uh, significant problems uh, where it's a very large population of a pest, uh, that seems maybe um, too extreme, then we want to look a little closer and really see what's going on. Uh, and the question here is, have you ever noticed that certain pests are on one plant, not another? So understand that uh, in, in specifically aphids, you know, uh, many pests are very host specific, so they are going to only target that plant. So in this case, it's these lime green aphids that really love roses. You'll notice uh, um, an orange, uh, aphid, the oleander aphid that really likes the escapulus or the milkweed. Then there's that dark gray aphid that really likes the uh, chard, um, no, I'm sorry, the kale. We start to notice the different colors of aphids that uh, like different plants. So that's already one thing. So there's no need to panic. When we see aphids this extreme uh, on this particular rose, we don't have to worry that these aphids are going to go anywhere else. Um, the next thing in this case, the plant can be stressed. So this plant is clearly stressed. It was actually in a parking lot uh, where I could tell that it was really stressed and it was probably getting fed synthetic fertilizers and it probably wasn't getting watered properly. It also uh, had poor soil. Uh, so I'm sure the drainage wasn't very good, nor was the health of the soil very good. So we always want to look at, again, the why. Uh, why is this problem happening? Why is it so severe? Remember, um, some aphids are going to be beneficial. I want to see some aphids or some pests in my garden because they're food for uh, the beneficial insects. Um, in this case, also it's lack of predators. We don't see any beneficial insects on here. So when it comes to um, the white flies, the aphids, the mealybugs, spider mites, now mealybugs are just going to be really challenging. They can come in with uh, cut flowers from uh, the farmer's market or from a grocer. They can come in from uh, uh, a, they can come in with a new house plant that you've introduced. Mealy bugs are really tenacious and really challenging to manage. Um, Spider mites are typically indicators of the area being really, really dry. Uh, white flies are typically indicators that it's poor drainage or the soil is staying too wet for too long. Um, and then we always want to look at the other things that we've mentioned in our other programs, you know, making sure we're uh, increasing the health of the soil. We're always feeding organically. If we're using synthetic fertilizers uh, and you've got significant pest problems, well, that's the connection. OK, so I just wanted to point a couple of these things out. But um, what we're looking at is the our goal is to grow a healthy garden ecology. OK, so some pests are seasonal and are expected, such as the aphids. And here are those uh, golden aphids. These are the oleander aphids on this milkweed. Um, and this uh, Stephanie, who's one of our uh, partners, took this picture and sent it to me. I just absolutely love it. So know that without having some pests in the garden, we wouldn't have food for our beneficial insects. And that food for our beneficial insects is what helps keep a healthy balance in the garden. Uh, we need to look at or reevaluate the thresholds of tolerance. Uh, so having some pests for me is a really good thing. And I hope that our program today helps you understand that having some pests are actually going to be a good thing too. Um, an infestation of a pest can be a clue that something isn't working and that that plant is stressed, as we've mentioned. So uh, we might repeat ourselves a lot in these programs, and it's because we uh, are, are meeting, you know, people like you every single day, and we're hearing these similar pest problems. You know, the one thing I can share is everyone has a pest problem, and we love helping people solve those pest problems, but oftentimes the solution is really easy. It's just uh, changing a few of the ways we um, grow our gardens by, you know, working with organic fertilizers, watering properly, uh, right plant, right place, and so forth. 
but we're going to talk about some of the pests that just are going to be more of a problem that we'd like to reduce. So let's start by talking about slugs and snails. Uh, I uh, particularly do not like slugs and snails at all. Um, I'm kind of grossed out by them. Uh, so here are some tricks. We're going to reduce their hiding places. We want to understand that they hide under the lip of pots, uh, under the lip of raised beds. Um, they can under, hide underneath like a fence line. Anywhere that there is like a little bit of shade, they're going to hide because they don't like the sun. They're a little bit like vampires. They like cool and moist. Um, we also understand that along planting areas, so are like my vegetable beds or my flower beds, I want to keep the vegetation low. I want to mow. I want to make sure I've cut weeds back or I've pulled those weeds uh, because those are also going to help uh, keep those areas cool and moist and create hiding places for them. We also want to switch to drip. So not only is drip irrigation a more effective way to water and you're going to save water over time, um, but it's going to reduce the slugs and snails. And another thing is, is we want to avoid watering in the evening. The best time to water is in the early pre-sunrise to sunrise hours uh, because pests like slugs and snails, um, pill bugs, sow bugs, earwigs, a lot of pests really like that moisture. And if we're watering in the evening, then it's a whole evening of ideal conditions for them just to hang out and chew your plants. So, uh, and then another thing is just understand that there are some plants out there that snails just love like daylilies, hostas, agapanthas. Uh, so hopefully we're avoiding those plants or really monitoring those plants if we have them. Some solutions, well, we can hand pick them off. Um, I, I always recommend to wear gloves though. Hand pick them off, um, you can squish them, you can drop them in a bucket of soapy water, you can also feed them to the ducks. Ducks love snails. Uh, I use snail boards, that's the picture on the left, which is just some fence boards with uh, some one by two runners underneath. It doesn't have to even be that complicated. Um, just a, a board on top of like maybe some bricks. But the idea is, is when we put this snail board next to an area where there's a lot of snail activity, like I said, they're going to go there under um, when the heat of the sun comes on as shade. And now what we can do is in the middle of the day, we can lift that board up and literally scrape the slugs and snails off. It's disgusting. Next thing is, is we can prevent them from accessing some of our plants with the copper tape barrier. Uh, if you can find copper foil, that also works, but copper tape is very popular and commonly found in our retailers. Uh, you just understand that slugs and snails don't like to cross it. They actually get like an uh, electric shock. Um, and then you can also use a chunky uh, wooden mulch. Chunky wooden mulch is difficult for them to cross. So I actually have a barrier around some of my veggie beds. That's just this really thick barrier. That's just like a little mound of wood mulch around the edge and they're not able to access the food that they normally would. And then if you are needing to go for a pesticide, uh, typically you won't need to with all these other options that we've talked about, but if you do, there is a uh, uh, eco-friendly pesticide that is iron phosphate. Uh, these are baits that are going to be safe for the environment. They are not going to be toxic for them. However, you do want to use caution. We want to always be mindful. If we have a whole jug and it happens to get broken on the ground, like maybe run over by a car in the driveway, and then a dog comes over and starts eating it all, well, you're gonna to wanna to take your pet to the vet because they could have an allergic reaction. So uh, again, these are all pesticides designed to kill things. So we still, even though they're less toxic and eco-friendly, we wanna use caution. All right, earwigs and pill bugs, AKA roly polies and sow bugs. They can, this is what I'm battling with right now. Um, I absolutely, um, they're not my friends. So, and they cause a lot of damage. You know, the dahlias, the zinnias, um, my strawberries are all getting kind of like, you know, chewed up pretty significantly. Um, we're gonna follow very similar uh, tactics as we did with slugs and snails, watering early in the morning and avoiding that moisture at night. But, um, oh. But some of the solutions are going to be uh, working with traps as well. And working with traps is one of my most successful techniques. It is literally a uh, deli container that we might get salsa or um, hummus or guacamole in. 
and we empty it, of course, wash it out. We've enjoyed that uh, delicious snack. But now we're gonna take that container and we're gonna reuse it and repurpose it. And we're gonna uh, cut holes in the lid, as you see here, they don't have to be pretty. And now I've put just a little bit of water, uh, maybe about uh, a half an inch or an inch of water, a couple drops of dish detergent, and then a couple drops of something that's like uh, fish oil or fish sauce or something kind of fishy. So like the uh, oil from the tuna or sardines or anchovies, just a couple drops in there that's going to attract the earwigs and the roly polies. And then we bury this so the lid is at the same surface of the soil and they go in at night, they drop in and they can't get out. It is very successful. Now, there's other things you can use. You can make barriers with diatomaceous earth. We always wanna make sure diatomaceous earth is not on the plant parts because it can actually uh, act as a desiccant for those plants. Uh, but the barrier actually has to be fresh and dry and it actually has to be significant. So typically about one to two inches wide and kind of mounding. Okay. Uh, once it gets wet, doesn't really work as well. So it's a problem with um, moist mornings, right? Um, and then there's also uh, eco-friendly baits out there. The, again, it's going to be that iron phosphate, but now it's blended with uh, spinosad, which uh, is going to be another ingredient that uh, they have to ingest. It makes it a little bit more broad spectrum. So now we're able to tackle not just slugs and snails, but earwigs, roly polies, uh, cutworms, and some other things. Citrus leaf miner. So citrus leaf miner is very common in the Bay Area. It is a little moth. Uh, she's kind of fuzzy and pretty. Uh, what she does is lay her eggs underneath the leaves of the citrus, and then those eggs hatch, and the larvae actually tunnels between the two layers of the leaf, so it's completely protected from most predators. Uh, I will say that we do have a, um, hold on, yeah, uh, and uh, however, however, we can use some uh, uh, citrus leaf miner traps that will help us identify when the adults are present. And then we can start to monitor, maybe try to remove those eggs with our fingers, uh, but it is underneath the leaves. And I'm not sure how mature your citrus are, but mature citrus get really dense and are kind of hard to navigate and really get in there. But I can also share that when we're working with a lot of uh, synthetic fertilizers or um, you know, uh, really pumping the citrus with a lot of nitrogen, that nitrogen rich new growth is very attractive to the adults because they know that they're going to be loaded with a lot of plant sugars and those plant sugars are just ideal for their larvae. So understand that um, the citrus leaf miner, though the damage is unappealing, it's not attractive. Uh, in most cases, uh, mature uh, citrus trees can handle the damage, especially if uh, we're treating them organically and uh, really providing all those good healthy garden practices. Some solutions is we want to prevent plant stresses. We're going to monitor that growth for the pests uh, and these traps are very commonly are common and available throughout retailers. Uh, but something I want to share is that there is a um, a predatory wasp that's in our area that does come and lay an egg inside the larva. It will pierce through the leaf and uh, lay an egg inside that larvae. And then when that egg hatches, it will then um, feed on that larvae, preventing it from emerging as an adult. It's kind of gross, but it's very effective. These wasps are tiny. They are about the size of a fungus gnat, if not smaller. So we wouldn't even recognize them. Uh, something else I can share is we wanna be very strategic and selective when the way we prune. We want to prune uh, typically early in the spring after frost or uh, in the fall about six weeks before the uh, first frost that we would hit in the winter. And the reason why is because we want the plants to leaf out and not uh, before the frost come or after the frost has come. But we want to be selective about pruning because every time we prune, we're encouraging new growth. So we're not pruning like constantly throughout the season. We really want to limit it to once a year. Um, and the reason why we want to be mindful of that new growth is because the adult knows that the eggs, when that larva hatches, it can pierce through that new growth. So that's what we want to, we want to limit 
the uh, uh, accessibility. And then um, there are products out there such as Finisad. This is the liquid, not the granular. Note that on the liquid, the label says it's limited to six applications a year to prevent uh, pesticide resistance, which we've seen. Um, and then also there's oils out there that you can use that will work more as suffocants to um, reduce, uh, to prevent the eggs from hatching. Uh, vegetable leaf miner is different. Vegetable leaf miner is actually a fly instead of a moth. Again, laying its eggs on the back of common vegetables like chard, beet, spinach. Um, they will also overwinter in the soil and they will start to show up when the temperature is warm. So the key here is that uh, if we, I personally, I only grow chard during the cool season. I don't, uh, I start to remove it from my garden beds once uh, the temperature is warm because I don't have any tolerance for the leaf miner and I don't want to uh, use any pesticides. But some things that can help uh, prevent it uh, is one, rotating your crops. This is very important. We rotate the crops because the larvae overwinters in the soil. If I'm planting chard in the same place year after year or the beets and the spinach, I'm going to be sure to get leaf miner year after year. If I'm able to rotate the crops, I'm going to reduce that. We're going to also use that floating row cover only if we've never had leaf miner in that area. Because again, if it's overwintered, now we've just created this little incubator, this perfect environment for them. So that's also super important. We're going to work with blue sticky traps. Blue sticky traps are going to help monitor for activity so that we can go and then start to hunt for those eggs and remove them. Those eggs literally look like little mini grains of rice we just scrape them off with our fingernail no problem we're going to remove the damaged leaves you can see the larvae in the leaf sometimes you can just squish it which is totally gross but uh if you don't want to squish it you can cut out the infected areas and put it in a bag seal that bag and put it in the green waste bin if we just put the leaves in the green waste bin that larva is going to emerge as an adult. And the next time we open up the green waste bin, they're just gonna fly back into the garden. And then we can apply beneficial nematodes to the soil uh, in the early spring, and they will feed on the larva that has overwintered. Uh, flea beetles. Okay, flea beetles, getting ahead of myself. Okay, flea beetles are pretty significant. Okay, they can. there's different species that hit different types of plants. I have had the experience with flea beetles before. They're very tiny, um, really just, uh, yeah, what is 0 0.06 of an inch or a 12th of an inch. Um, and they jump around like fleas. That's the indicator. So if you don't know you have them, you can go over and kind of brush the leaves and you might see things hop around. Um, they chew the holes in the leaves. They rarely are going to uh, chew on any of the fruit. So here we go. Let's look at the tolerance. If it's only affecting the leaves and not the parts of the plant that I want to eat, my tolerance is a little different. I'm going to be okay with some activity, but here's the key because they will over the adults will overwinter on the plant parts or in the soil sanitation, making sure we're really diligent about cleaning up the plants. So if we've done any trimming, if we've trimmed any of the leaves or any parts of the plant fall on the ground, we want to make sure we've cleaned them up and get them in the green waste bin and get them off site. Uh, even the mulch, if we have mulch on the soil, which I don't see in this picture, and I highly recommend that we have mulch on the soil around the root zones of the plants. Um, if we have mulch in place and we have flea beetles, we're going to want to also just remove the mulch in that area, okay? Uh, understand crop rotation, uh, rotating those crops and then planting a non-host plant in this area is key. So this is really important to help reduce and um, manage this pest. Using that floating row cover will help prevent it if you want to plant tomatoes in another part of your garden. Um, again, mulch with straw to reduce egg laying because they will lay their eggs down in the soil. Um, intercrop with companion plants to deter pests. And some of those companion plants are going to be like marigolds. Um, Charlotte, what was the other one we came up with? I know that we talked about using uh, radishes are listed as a deterrent. We can put radishes in an area to kind of drive them away from an area. Um, 
you could put it in the chat if you remember. And then again, applying beneficial nematodes to the soil to so they can feed on the uh, larvae and the eggs that are overwintering. If we need to use a pesticide, we can use the eco-friendly product that's pyrethrin. And I did email everybody uh, a list of how what these pesticides are, and I will re will re send it out uh, after with the link to the recording. Okay. Oh no, I still go. Okay. Well, Charlotte, were you going to talk about white? Okay, I'll talk about it. So the cabbage looper. So this is going to be really common. It's that little white butterfly we see in our gardens. Uh, the larva, the looper can grow to be about uh, just a little over an inch, a little shorter than an inch and a half. It's light green with faint orange uh, and yellow stripes on it. So, uh, but much larger than the uh, serpent fly larvae and looks a little different, but really loves all of the cold crops. So cabbages, cauliflowers, collard greens, kale, mustard greens, broccoli, turnips, and so forth. Um, the adults are not active during the cold months. So that's really great news. But once we start to get warm, you're going to see activity. So here's the deal. These are all cold season or cooler season crops. So it's best to plant them during the cooler season. And then we, uh, as the temperatures warm, if they're not ripe yet, or if they're not ready for harvest, we do want to take advantage of that floating row cover to prevent that moth from laying eggs. However, if we're tending to those plants and doing any type of maintenance and we've got that row cover off, we've turned our back for a second, let me tell you, that moth is really smart and can easily come in and lay some eggs without us even seeing it. And then we put that row cover back on and in two weeks we open up, we're like, what the heck? They're all eaten up. So just want to share that the best way to uh, manage this is to really get up close and personal, to monitor, to uh, remove those eggs, to remove those loopers, just hand remove them. And if we need to use a product, we can use the Eco Pesticide BT. Cucumber beetles. Cucumber beetles are a big deal. Uh, some years they're just significant and other years, not so much. They're tiny. They really are about the same size as a lady beetle. Uh, some people call these the green ladybug or the male bug instead of a ladybug. Uh, but um, they will overwinter as adults. Their larvae will also overwinter in the soil and they feed on a very wide variety of plants. So less host specific, more very broad. Um, the larvae will also feed on plant roots uh, and the larvae always are going to be living in the soil before they emerge in a, as an adult. Because, oh, also I'll share, they really like moisture. So if we, here in the Bay Area, we have fog. Fog uh, really brings a lot of moisture. So that's why we have a tendency to have more of these pests. They like warmer areas and they like moist mornings. So a um, couple ways to manage them is to apply nematodes to the soil uh, early in the spring before those temperatures begin to warm so that they can uh, knock back the, the larvae that's overwintered. Crop rotation is the key. Sanitation, cleaning up plant de debris to reduce overwintering pests. Using that row cover to pre prevent pests as long as we know that they're not in that area. And then working with traps to monitor and reduce the populations. There's a theme here. And then with cucumber beetles, they're really smart. Um, they literally, when they see you coming, they'll just drop. So I, I think I'm smarter, right? I'm, we're all smarter than these pests, I would like to think. So I just go out with a soapy bucket of water and when they drop, they drop right into the bucket of water. I literally have it underneath the plant. In this case, I'm just like moving the flower over to the side and dropping them in. I'm going to say this is a great technique for a lot of things, not only the slugs and snails and the cucumber beetles, but other beetles and weevils, such as the hoplia and the rose cucurus. These are going to be uh, pests that are more of a nuisance and really difficult to, I would say difficult to almost impossible, well, I won't say impossible, very difficult to control with any type of pesticide. So again, we're going to use those mechanical controls. We're going to go out and monitor and knock these pests into a soapy bucket of water very successfully. And then fungal diseases. Fungal diseases uh, really start to appear, especially when we have uh, late spring rains like we've had. Uh, we will start to see powdery mildew once things start to get drier and warmer. Uh, we already had a little spell of dry worm where powdery mildew was starting to peak up. So 
Powdery mildew likes dry, warm, black spot and rust likes moist. So some solutions, we are going to provide healthy garden practices. We're going to avoid any overhead watering. We're going to avoid sprinklers. We're switching a drip, okay? We want to ensure plants have really good airflow. So you might selectively prune to open up air circulation. And I like to defoliate, especially my roses where I see a lot of black spot and rust. I'll remove the leaves on the bottom third of the plant just to increase that airflow. We want to remove any of the disease leaves or uh, plant parts as soon as we can because the fungal, these fungal diseases can spread with the wind. All right. Um, powdery mildew, on the other hand, uh, because it is uh, it grows in dry conditions, it's really easy just to wash it off with water. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but we just wash it off. But when we wash it off, we want to make sure we get the top of the leaf and the bottom of the leaf. And we want to do this early in the morning so those water droplets can dry before sundown so that we don't actually increase the black spot in the rust. If we need to use a product, there are a lot of eco fungicides on the market, but understand that these products are just going to provide um, some temporary uh, control. They will not completely eliminate the problem. So we wanna just make sure we're always planting the right plant in the right place and we're providing those healthy garden practices. Okay, thank you. Hopefully I'll go, get through this really fast too. <laughs> Before we get into mosquitoes, though, some people had questions about ants, so I'm just going to touch on that really quick. We didn't, don't have a slide for that, but there's a fantastic fact sheet on our website that you can go to for more information. But I'll give you the cliff notes right now. For um, indoor ants, uh, you know, the best thing to keep any indoor pest out of your home is to make sure you phys they physically can't come in. So that's sealing up your cracks, adding fresh weather stripping, uh, door sweeps, things like that. So that the ants can physically not come in your house. Um, and then if you do still have ants in your home, uh, there are several boric acid baits, uh, liquid or powder baits on, um, on the market that you can take and that you can get and they are designed for the ants to find their sugar bait with boric acid so they're attractive they um they the ants will find the bait so it might actually get a little worse before it gets better they're going to swarm the bait station and then they're going to take it back to their colony and they'll kill the whole colony that way so be patient when you're using um, bait stations and then diatomaceous earth, as we've talked about before, is also an effective way to manage ants, cockroaches, silverfish, uh, lots of indoor crawling insects. Ants outdoors are, um, you know, less of a pest, I would say. Some people don't like them, um, but, you know, they're more of, uh, they are decomposers. So they do help decompose organic matter in the soil. They aerate the soil. And they're good in a way in that they indicate, they're usually indicators of other pests. So if you see ants crawling up a tree, it's likely that there's actually another pest in your tree in the leaves. So inspect that tree and look for aphids, scale, uh, white fly, because ants like to harvest the sticky uh, honeydew that's left behind by certain pests like aphids and scale. So um, they can really just, they can clue you in um, they can also, though, unfortunately, they will also defend the pest against their natural predators. So it is good to manage your ants outside when you do have see them harvesting or, uh, you know, protecting the pest insect like aphids and scale. Um, so what you can do, easy ways to do are just washing the plant off, washing the ants off, um, and then there are outdoor uh, bait stations as well. And that was a cliff note, so I do recommend going to the fact sheet if you want more information. <laughs> so mosquitoes. Um, <clears throat> so mosquitoes are the male mosquito is actually considered a, is a pollinator, but the female is the one that bites and seeks the meal. Um, the egg and larva um, are aquatic and can live in just a single teaspoon of water. So really keep that in mind when you're looking for water areas of water in your yard. 
So you're going to be inspecting your property for any standing water. And that could just be like a leaf that is, you know, in a cup, uh, cup form that's holding a teaspoon of water. Even that small amount of water can hold a mosquito larva. So you're going to turn over pots and, you know, any debris around that could collect water. Be really diligent about um, tipping them over and making sure that they are uh, free of any standing water. And then if you have rain barrels, that's fantastic, but you do wanna make sure that you're really securing them so that the mosquitoes can't get in and lay, the, um, lay their eggs in that water. If you do have standing water like a pond or a horse trough or a rain barrel, um, a great um, uh, control method for that would be these products called, um, well, they're made out of a BTI, Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, it's a bacteria that uh, you can put in the water and it will uh, kill the larva. And it comes in several different products, mosquito dunks, mosquito plunks, or mosquito bits. Um, all excellent products for that and non-toxic. They won't harm birds in a bird bath or horses for the horse trough or um, any uh, like, you know, fish in a pond as well. So there's the really folk narrow spectrum only for mosquito larva. And then of course, physical barriers, placing screens in the windows and doors, making sure there's no holes, wearing your protective clothing. There are eco-friendly mosquito repellents made of essential oils that can um, provide temporary relief, but they're not going to remove, you know, spraying them in your yard as a fogger is only going to cause temporary relief. It's not going to be a long-term solution. Really just removing any sources of egg laying, it's going to be the longer term solution. And keep in mind also that, uh, especially um, with mosquitoes, there are free pest management services offered by counties. Um, so if you have a big issue in your neighborhood, or maybe there's, you know, like a neighbor has a pool that's just sitting there empty and kind of just clearly a breeding zone, you can call vector control and have them check out your yard, check out the neighbors, you know, make sure um, there's not a problem and deal with it as well. Okay, and then fungus gnats. Um, fungus gnats are often an indoor pest, indoor house pest. You know, you have your, your house plants and you see these little tiny bugs flying, coming out of the soil and flying around. Um, I would say they're more of a nuisance and maybe not, I don't know if they cause damage. Uh, Suzanne, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they're more of like just something you don't want in your house, which is very understandable. Um, uh, one, you know, fungus gnats are a sign of overwatering. So if you're overwatering your plants, they're gonna they're gonna breed and hatch in the soil. So a great way to manage them is to make sure you're watering. Uh, you do want to water deeply, but you do want to let the soil surface inch or so, inch or two, depending on the size of the plant. You do want to let that dry out between watering. So just um, that's one again symptom. Um, overwatering could be the that could just be it. That could be your problem solved right there. If you continue to have fungus gnats, you can consider replacing the soil. Sometimes they come in from the nursery um, or wherever you purchase them. So you would just wanna replace the soil, just shake that soil out, throw it away, add new fresh soil. You could also consider a soil-less planting medium, which would be just more mineral particles, um, vermiculite, perlite, and like a coconut coir or a, a sphagnum moss mix. You can buy um, that mix or you can make it yourself. And that will have less opportunity for the fungus gnats to um, hatch, to live in the soil. You can also offer, uh, you know, use sticky traps in and around your house plants. And then uh, there are beneficial nematodes that you can buy that are specific for fungus gnats. Make sure you make sure that you get the ones that are for fungus gnats because there's lots of species for different kinds of pests. Those are little organisms that you kind of water into your plant and they parasitize the fungus gnats. And then also those mosquito bits that I uh, mentioned at the last slide. Um, also can be used to get rid of fungus gnats. You can either make a tea out of them, um, soak them in water and then water them, the water into your plant and your soil, or you can sprinkle them into onto the top layer and like maybe dig them in a little bit. And as they, as you water it, they'll break down. 
and work with the fungus gnats. Okay, rats. I know someone already asked about rats. So I know a lot of you are we're all focusing on our veggie gardens now in the summer. So rats in the garden are a big um, problem for sure. Um, and the, the idea with rats in the garden is we want to remove hiding places and we want to remove access to food. Those are the two main things that's going to be the best way to keep them out. So remove places of harborage, that's debris piles, uh, really dense ivy or brush, anything where any place where they can hide and then contain all areas of food. And that can be your compost pile, your chicken coops, uh, your garbage bins, your, um, and then any pet food that you have available in either you're feeding them the animals outside or you're keeping your um, food in the garage. You want to really make sure they have no access to the food. Um, rats can chew through pretty much everything. So we're going super, super secure. Uh, if you can get a metal container for your, for your dog food, that's going to be best. Um, also reconsider bird feeders. Birds feeders are a really big source of food for rats. Um, so we maybe consider taking those away for a while. Your birds can find lots of other food in the garden, especially if you have some pests in your garden, they will eat those pests. And then uh, remove um, any other food sources. Uh, so if, you, if they're eating your veggies, you do wanna just enclose your veggies with exclusion frames. Um, there's a beautiful one pictured here on the slide. Uh, you do want to use, use um, quarter inch hardware cloth to contain your veggie gardens so that they can't have access to them. And then gophers. I get questions about gophers all the time and I feel your pain. Um, the best way to manage gophers is prevention. Um, so any new plant you're putting in the ground, consider putting it in a gopher basket. Uh, the baskets are baskets that go in the ground first in that hole and then the plant goes inside it. It provides space for the roots to grow, but it, it blocks access to the gophers eating the roots. Um, and then if you're installing a raised bed, you do want to um, line the bottom of your raised bed all the way up the side with um, gopher wire or half inch hardware cloth. That's going to prevent them from coming up. Um, and then making sure you're monitoring you, uh, and then you can consider traps as well. If you already have gopher activity in your yard, you can consider using traps um, to eliminate them. Um, repellents are moderately effective. They do need to be repeatedly um, added repeatedly or reapply, that's what I meant to say. Um, castor oil is a very effective repellent um, and it can come in a liquid or a granular form. Um, I recommend, of course, reading the label because they do um, offer tactics on how to place the repellent so to be most effective. And then so this is for many pests, uh, as we already talked about, rats, mice, voles, um, gophers, squirrels, birds, deer. The best way to keep them out is physical exclusion. Um, and if that looks different for each kind of um, pest because of course they're different sizes. So rats, mice, and voles, you wanna use quarter inch hardware cloth because that is the size they cannot fit through. Gophers, you can use a half inch hardware cloth because they're a little bit bigger. Squirrels and rabbits, you can use three quarter inch, inch um, fencing or cloth or a poultry wire. And then deer, to keep deer out, you do want to have a seven foot or taller uh, fence around your property. And then some more pictures of exclusion cages. They can be very simple. They can be very elaborate. You can, uh, they can be for birds as well. Birds can cause a lot of damage to seedlings. Um, so they do keep a lot of pests out. So in, you know, once you build one big one, you can plant a lot inside of it. So it's definitely a good thing to consider um, because especially if we live in an urban area, there are just some pests are just unavoidable. And then some other pests like raccoons, cats, dogs, they can cause problems like digging. Um, so we want to uh, 
there are a few other physical thing, tools that we can use. Um, cat scat mats or poultry wire on um, either you know a planted area or a lawn will prevent raccoons and cats from uh, digging or walking on that area. Uh, well, maybe not walking, but digging in that area to use as a litter box. Raccoons usually dig because they're looking for grubs and insects in the soil. So again, having that physical barrier on the lawn or the soil is going to pr protect that. And then um, bird netting also can be used to keep cats and birds, of course, squirrels and um, other critters out as well, both on the ground and above on the plants too. <laughs> All right, and then I just wanted to review the chemical controls because we did mention some of them. We're always going to use them as a last resort if we choose to use them at all. Um, understanding that they're really not, you know, they're not really going to, they're not going to solve the problem. We have to figure out what the real problem is. We're going to always know our pest and only target that pest. We're going to spot apply. So we're only spraying where the pest is when the pest is present. We're never going to spray just the whole garden as a preventative measure. That's just um, going to kill a lot of unnecessary things potentially. We're going to always choose the less toxic and most eco friendly options, uh, narrow spectrum options. If we're spraying, we're going to spray at the end of the day. That's when the beneficial insects and pollinators are less active. So we have less chance of harming them. Uh, we're going to avoid applying when plants are in bloom because again, we don't want to harm those pollinators and we don't want to deter any pollinators to come to those plants to pollinate. And we're always going to understand the unintended consequences. Um, to ourselves, to the environment, to the other insects and life in the, in the, in the garden. And along that lines, we're going to wear our PPE because even the eco-friendlies can cause harm to us. They're designed to kill, so they can cause skin irritation, lung irritation, eye irritation. We really want to be careful. We're going to wear long pants, long sleeves, closed-toed shoes. We have hopefully a mask and eye covering as well. One thing I just want to um, add uh, to what Charlotte said is that when we are going for a chemical control, it is because we have exercised all the other options and understand that the chemical controls, these pesticides, even though they're eco-friendly, uh, they're not solving the problem. They're just killing the pests and possibly beneficial organisms as well. So uh, with some of the pest problems that y'all are coming up with, very common. A lot of people have these pest problems, but please trust that when we say to reduce the watering or to wa change the way you water or to change the way you're feeding your plants, it's because we've seen that that's the reason why the pest problems are going to become uh, more exasperated or why the plants get stressed. Uh, it seems like we're doing the right thing because that's what we were taught. But then what we learn is that that wasn't really the right thing. Feeding with synthetic fertilizers actually makes the situation worse. Watering regularly makes the situation worse. So we really need to learn these environments um, and practice the healthy garden practices that we've taught and then know that the chemical controls uh, do not solve the problem. All right, sorry, Charlotte, thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And then we'll leave you with some IPM resources. We have our, our Water our World website with all of our fact sheets on there. <clears throat> and then um, the UC IPM website, I highly recommend for identifying our pests. They have a weed gallery. So if you wanna learn more about weeds and they have a great tool, a, a pest diagnostic tool or plant diagnostic tool. Um, to figure out that will help you figure out you know, what's really going on. Is it a fertilizing issue or is it a wind issue or is it a pest and what kind of pest it is? Um, it's a great way to help with identification when you have no idea what you're looking at. And then the uh, bug guide, bugguide.net, great place to learn about different pests and bugs, both good and bad. And then the National Pesticide Information Center, uh, where you can learn about the different pesticides and their um, harms or mode of action. 
what was that? The mode of action. The mode of action and yeah. yes, all the rest. Yeah. And bugguide.net is really awesome. If you have a bug in your garden, you don't know what it is, you take a picture and you can sign up and email it to them and they give you a reply uh, within, gosh, 30 minutes. And I believe it's Purdue or Oregon. I, I can never remember the university they're connected with, but it's pretty fun. I've had to use them a couple of times. So with that, we'd just like to thank you. Uh, so many wonderful questions, so many wonderful comments. I love, love, love um, these programs and I love how interactive they are. And I love all the comments um, that the community really shares together. 